Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, as she mentioned, we'll be talking about connection design with NDS and technical report number 12. <clears throat> this presentation is registered or is copyrighted by the American Wood Council. If you'd like to use any portion of the presentation, you can contact us and we can help expedite that. Also, this presentation is registered with AIA for continuing education and also ICC and NCSEA SEA for sorry about that for continuing education NCSEA. Um, the description here is provided and it is in the PDF so when you look back at your notes you'll remember what the description was for the presentation and then we also include the learning objectives that were provided when you registered but we'll go over them now. So the learning objectives today are to become familiar with current wood member connection solutions and applicable design requirements. We'll also look at technical report 12 and provisions for connections designed beyond the NDS and that's what Lori will be speaking about. And then we'll become familiar or rec you'll be able to recommend fastener guidelines for wood to steel, wood to concrete and wood to wood connection. That's the great aspect or characteristics about wood is the ease of being able to connect to other building materials. And then we'll look at describing effects of moisture on wood member connections and implementing proper detailing to mitigate issues that can occur. And this is in a very important aspect of when designing with wood, knowing what the end conditions of the structure that is being designed. So now we'll start off, as Suzanne mentioned, we'll talk about, uh, we'll have polls throughout the presentation to um, have an interaction between you, the audience, and us as presenters, and this is our first poll. So I'll hand it over to Suzanne. Okay. So to start today, what is your profession? You've got an easy one. Architect, engineer, code official, building designer, or other? We've got about 75% of the votes in. I'm going to close it in one more second. Okay, so here are our results. We've got few architects, the majority, vast majority of engineers, 9% code officials, no building designers, and a couple of others. Wow, great. Thank you, Suzanne. And I'm wondering what those 2% others are. But looks like the majority of our audience is engineers, and um, we have some code officials and architects. Well, thank you, everyone, for participating in the poll. And hopefully you'll gain some valuable information out of this presentation. So let me go here. Um, the outline, or the overall outline of today's presentation is we're going to look at wood connection design philosophy, connection behavior, serviceability challenges, connection hardware, and fastening techniques, and connection techniques, and this is where Lori will be picking up um, kind of halfway through the presentation, and she'll get into the nuts and bolts of the calculations and the equations um, the first half, we're going to go over just the overall philosophy about connection design and what designers and code officials need to look at and architects need to consider when they're looking at the overall design of a, of a connection because you can do all the number crunching and do all the calculations and the equations, but if you don't take all these other characteristics of wood itself into consideration, there may be some challenges out in the field under the in-service condition. So I get the fun part without all the equations, and Lori will pick up with all the equations and getting into the NDS and some design examples. <clears throat> so first off, connections, wood design connection philosophy. Some of you may be familiar with these uh, slides here, but when we're dealing with connections, and I'm not talking about, uh, well, we all know that a lot of the typical wood connections in a typical wood building, you go to a catalog and you get your design loads, your capacity required, and then you go to a catalog and you choose a hardware from a certain manufacturer. Um, so there's not a, a whole lot of design 
per se of that connection. But when we're doing actual design of a connection, we need to take into consideration the end use and how the wood will work in the end condition environment. So it's very important to understand these basic concepts when we're doing that. So if we looked at wood under a microscope, we would see long tubular-like cells. And we can idealize that or uh, model that as if those cells were all like a bundle of straws. So in this slide here, the grain of the wood is from east to west, east to west being side to side on this uh, actual slide. So wood is very strong parallel to grain or parallel to those straws. So then when we pull on those straws, wood is strong. And then when we push on those straws, this is where the very strength of the strongest uh, strength of the wood is in compression, and wood is even stronger. However, if we apply a perpendicular, perpendicular load to that, wood is less strong. So long parallel to grain, compression and tension parallel to grain, wood is very strong. Perpendicular to grain, wood is less strong. So we're going to carry this concept out throughout the rest of the presentation. <clears throat> And so when we know, now that we know that compression wood likes uh, the load carried per parallel to grain in compression, it's very easy to capitalize on that concept when we design our connections. And when you think about it, wood is a natural material, and you think about how trees actually resist the load in the natural environment, it's pretty much all in compression. Um, and that's how the wood grows. So it makes sense that that's the strength of wood. Here's some other examples of uh, connections that are capitalizing on wood in parallel to grain in compression. <clears throat> However, oh, and another concept that we need to consider also is when we're actually designing the connection and how we're transferring the load from whatever we're connecting to the wood member. Wood doesn't, uh, it's better to have the load spread over the surface of the wood rather than in one bolt, one connection. Not only does this add redundancy to co our connection, but it spreads the load all over the, the surface of the wood where these connectors are. So uh, another philosophy to think about, rather than having one bolt, we would want to have a, a lot of other smaller connectors across this surface of the wood. One thing that we need to also consider is when we're doing hanging loads perpendicular to grain. And this is, if we have a connection here, it's the load is acting downwards. This is the Achilles heel of wood where we're causing tension perpendicular to grain. It's not recommended. Now the initiator of these types of tension perpendicular grain is notches, large diameter fasteners, and hanging loads. And we'll look at that in the next few slides and what that means. Now here's a notch in the wood member. We have a bearing connection here. The load is transferred through the wood member and then bearing here. So all the load is being transferred in bearing down onto this support. Well, that's going to cause a focus point here where we're going to have tension perpendicular grain, and then you may see some splitting in your member there. So that is not recommended. Whereas lowering the bearing position of that connection and not notching the uh, wood member is a better solution because you're not causing concentration of loads tension perpendicular to grain here. <clears throat> Here's another example of where a notch and bearing may cause splitting, which is not recommended, whereas a better solution would be lowering the bearing point of that wood member and uh, not providing any notch in that wood member. Now I mentioned another initiator of perpendicular or that splitting action perpendicular tension perpendicular to grain is hanging loads. And this is such an exam example where we have a plate uh, uh, where we are connecting here with bolts. And if this was a simply supported beam where it's supported on the two ends of the wood member, we would see a stress load diagram such as this where we have tension on the bottom of the beam, neutral axis is here and compression on the top. 
and by having the beam, the connection to the beam in the lower portion, that adds more tension perpendicular to grain. So we have a hanging load, the load is applied downward, and that can cause splitting in that location because we're adding to the tension perpendicular to grain. So that is not recommended. And in fact, in the NDS, in the commentary portion of the NDS, we, it does state that uh, to have to not have heavy or medium loads in that location because of the issues with perpendicular grain. Now, what is categorized is heavy and um, it does mention that in the NDS commentary that light loads can be used in that lower portion of the beam and they need to be less than 100 pounds and on the load or at uh, 24 inches on center of that spacing of the loads. So not recommended. Now a better solution to this is raising the connection into the upper portion, if you're going to have a hanging load, raising it up into the compression part of the actual wood beam. Or even better, let's see if that's, even better having a sling wrap option. So this then becomes, if the plate was wrapped around the top of the beam, that would then become a bearing type connection, not only just a um, a shear type connection. Now we talked about also tension perpendicular grain and another initiator of that tension perpendicular grain is when we have closely spaced fasteners. This is an application where we have nails that are closely spaced together. And what happens is, is remember the, the straws, they're up and down the uh, wood member. And what happens is, is when they're spaced, when the nails are spaced closely together, they act as a wedge. And they, when they're nailed or driven into the wood member, they can pry the straws apart or the grain apart. That's why when we have this nail, oops, let me go back, nail here and here, we want to, instead of having them all align with the straws, we want to stagger the nail. So instead of being aligned with that nail, we want to have the nail located here. So we're staggering with the grain of the wood. So if this nail was here, then the na next nail would be positioned here. So you're not all in the same line. So here's a quiz for all those that are listening to see if you understand what, oh, well, these should be hidden. Sorry, you have the answer in front of you but I typically have this hidden. Um, what you would see is here's a joint of a panel right here. So we have one panel here and wood structural panel here. And then there behind is a framing member that is perhaps a stud, a two by or three by stud up and down. And we're nailing the edge of the panel to that two by or three by. Well, when we talk about staggering, sometimes out in the field that staggering of nails can be confused by the framers or whoever's nailing the uh, nails into the member. And we, it might be good to have an actual diagram of what we mean by staggered. So in this condition, we're staggering it between this side, but we're talking about staggering the two by or three by member. So in this case, on the right illustration, we're staggering the nails with a grain of the wood. On this, although it looks like it's staggered, we're not actually staggering the nails with the grain of the wood. They're still all in line with the stra straws or the grain of the wood. Whereas this one, again, we're staggering. So another graphic that shows what happens uh, when we are not staggering, in this first picture, you would see the nails closely spaced and it's causing splitting. And we're not staggering the nail with the grain of the wood. Also with the middle picture, similarly, we're not staggering with the grain of the wood and it's causing splitting. So the last stud or whatever, two by member, we are staggering the grain of the wood and we're not getting any splitting of the nails. That's, like, that's why it's very important when we have closely spaced nails to say that we are the nails need to be staggered, and this is actually a requirement in the um, actually the wind and seismic provision that mentions a nail closely spaced nailing needs to be staggered. 
Now the other aspect that are characteristics of wood that we need to consider when we're designing wood connections is the environment in which the wood member is going to be um, in, in, in service use. We need to consider, because it's a hygroscopic material, it's a natural material, and it changes with the environment depending on the moisture content of the wood and the moisture content of the environment, it will change, it will move. It will expand in moist environments and it will um, contract in dry environments. So we need to take those, thing, those characteristics into consideration and we'll get more into that later on the pr presentation on how that affects a connection. <clears throat> also we need to consider the type of fasteners that we are and the number and the spacing of the fasteners when we're designing our connections. They're all different types of fasteners that are available in the industry for creating a, a connection and we'll look into that more later in the presentation as well. Now Suzanne we have one poll question, the second poll question. To the yes we do. Uh, tension perpendicular to the grain, like you were just talking about, can be caused by notches in the beam, hanging loads, large diameter fasteners, or all of the above. I'll give everybody a few seconds to vote. And we want to reiterate that these questions are not dependent on you. I mean, the correct answer is doesn't. It doesn't affect your CEUs or your certificates or anything like that. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to see that most of the people came up with the answer that I was thinking after listening to your presentation, so I'm going to go ahead and close it and share the results. So a uh, few people put notches in the beam, a couple more hanging loads, nobody picked large diameter fasteners, and 94% picked all of the above. So Michelle? Wow, I think that's the best <laughs> poll response we've gotten in our history of AWC webinars. That's excellent. Okay, thank you very much, Suzanne. And that was a little animation, all the above, that's correct. Notching of the beam, hanging load, and large diameter fasteners cause tension perpendicular to grain, which is something we want to avoid. Okay, now we'll look at connection behavior and um, an overall look at what um, we want to build into our connections when we're designing our connections. When we design our connections, we, um, let me look at the, there's a graph here that I'll show you in a minute, but on the vertical axis is load and that's the strength of our actual connection and then we have displacement. That means that as the load is applied it, it will move and in certain conditions we want the, the connections to displace, to provide some ductility so that there is not a brittle connection. So we want to have strength and ductility into our connection. So I mentioned about high strength or strength. We do want to have strong connections but we don't want to have a very brittle connection or a poor ductility uh, connection because we don't want abrupt failures. We want some indication that there is going to be a, a failure or yield if there is going to be one. So abrupt failures are not good. So high strength, but this has poor ductility. And then you could have something with low strength, low capacity in your connection, but then that connection is going to move and it's not going to be able to resist the loads because it has low strength. We want to have some balance in between there. So for example, if you have a seismic load on a building and that building has the strength to, or that connection has the strength to resist the loads, but it can move to resist that load and provide us some indication if there is a going to be some type of yielding, we can see that yielding, but it won't abruptly fail. So, looking at that, and this is a very simplistic way of looking at it, but it drives home the idea of we don't want something brittle, so when you hammer that brittle, it's going to break apart. It'll be very brittle, and there'll be an abrupt failure. And we don't want something that's very ductile that will not resist any load. So some of you are probably familiar with this slide, although I had to take the labels off of these candies because we may have been infringing on some um, 
anyway, copyright issues or whatever. But of these ideas regarding brittle, ductile, and somewhere in between, this is a question for the audience. You know, unfortunately, we didn't include this in a poll, but we have this here that you may look familiar. Kind of looks like a three musketeer that's soft in the middle. And then we have big cherry, I believe that's this one. It's also soft. It has some aggregate nuts in there, but not all the way through the whole body of the connection. Or we have something that looks kind of like a Heath bar that could be a very brittle failure. We have Big Hunk, and I realize this is not on the East Coast, but a Big Hunk is very kind of like hard taffy, but that can move and has aggregate throughout it to provide um, some strength. And then we have, or connection of all the material, and then we have, I believe this is a Snickers or a Payday. Now, maybe some of you in the audience are kind of debating this, but what I thought would provide a very good ductile, strong connection is a big hunk. And um, because it can move under lateral loads, but it has a lot of strength to provide. So what provides a very strong connection? We need a balance from strength and uh, ductility. Well, strength is based on the size of your fasteners and your number of fasteners. And then for ductility, ductility will be dependent on your fastener slenderness, how slender that fastener is, the spacing and the end distance and all of that, how that load is spread across the length of your connection or your member. So as an example, when we're talking about ductility, I've provided this just to give you an idea of what we mean by ductility. We know that wood structures, they resist loads very well, especially under lateral wind loads and, and seismic loads. And this gives you an idea of how ductility is built into the system through connections to provide a very um, good resistance to the load. We have a shear wall here. Our load is applied to the top of the wall. On this wall, we have wood structural panels, and we have the framing members behind. We have the hold downs at each end, so when this lateral load is applied to the shear wall, we get resistance for the overturning here in compression and tension from a hold down. And then the load transfers through the shear wall, through the wood structural panels, down to the foundation, is connected to the foundation, through the anchor bolts and then is connected to the foundation. So all of the nails that are applied to this wedge structural panel provide the ductility into the system. And we'll show that by this test that was performed on this 8x8 wood structural panel that was done uh, Curie protocol cyclic test and you can see strength on the vertical axis and displacement on the horizontal axis. And at its peak strength, we see a, a little over three inches of displacement. So that's the great characteristics about wood structures is they can displace quite a ways, three, over three inches, and be very strong. Um, just for those interested, where we, our design loads are right about here. So right in this in the, um, area here. Although the wood structural panel shear wall can resist loads all the way to here. Now out here, some of you are wondering, well, there, there's a drop up here, and that's where there was a failure in the shear wall. And that's where we build the ductility into the system. Now the ductility, as we mentioned, is by all the small fasteners, the nails that are provided through the connection of the wood structural panel in, this, in the um, shear wall. So we have a ductile resistance, I mean a ductile failure, which is what we want. We don't want a brilliant failure where there was a fracture or um, um, if the wood structural panel had some um, challenges with um, shear challenges or for example the framing, maybe there was a crack in the framing um, that occurred. We do not want that brittle type of failure. We want the ductile failure where um, there was nail pull out through the panel or maybe the nails withdraw from the framing member or tore out from the edge. This is showing um, a situation where they were pulled out from the, pulled away from the studs over here and um, the base plate. That's the type of failure we want to build into our system or the yielding of the system. So that gives you an idea of what we mean by ductile connections. Now serviceability challenges. This is something that's very important 
and that um, we all need to consider when we're designing our connections because we want to need to know, even though we can do the connection calculations, we can go to our software and crunch number and come up with our uh, number of anchor bolts or our number, I'm sorry, number of bolts that we need or screws that we need. If we don't understand the end service of the what these wood structures are going to be uh, exposed to, we could have some challenges or issues. This is an example. I mean, you can just drive around all types of cities and see, um, well, hopefully you don't see a lot of these, but <laughs> this is a condition that um, many of you may see that where it's not a proper detailing of this connection. Um, what happens is this glue lamb beam is exposed to the environment and there's water issue of the end grain is all exposed to the environment and similar to the what we talked about as straws that water is going to be drawn up within the body of the wood member because this is not protected from the environments and also water can build up on top and there's no direct egress of the water on top of this so it just goes down into the end grain you can see the exposed end grain of this wood member the other um, challenge we, that we have is the type of wood that we specify for this type of uh, exposure to the environment. And I know there's been some challenges that um, people are aware of. And the key here is, again, knowing what if it's going to be exposed to the environment and specifying the proper wood or preservative treatment for this type of situation. And I'll mention that in we talk about um, preservative treatment or a natural decay or natural durable wood species that needs to be specified in these conditions. The actual IBC code does have a definition. Some people may not be aware of this in Chapter 2 for what natural durable wood is. It has a definition of um, heartwood of the following species. Um, and it gives a whole definition uh, for decay resistance and termite resistance of redwood, cedar, um, Alaskan yellow cedar. So please look at your code, chapter two, on what natural durable wood is. Now this is a good example in this slide that shows you what um, some good detailing that is shown here. The end plates, the end grain of the wood is capped off and also there's also a cap on top of the wood member to shed the water away from the wood. If there is this, um, for this end cap, there are weep holes, so if any water gets trapped inside, there is a way for the water to exit out. So very important to think about. Um, just the flow of where water is and can provide very uh, successful connections to the environment. Now here's a, a condition where it was not detailed correctly. We have a situation where we have a wood member, the water would flow all the way down, and then there was no weep or nowhere for this water to go, but inside this bucket, which is basically what it was, a bucket where the water builds up and caused some decay issues and water issues um, when water gets built up. No direct egress of the water here where no flashing was provided to, to redirect the water away from this um, end condition. So the moisture gets trapped in there and it causes some issue with the wood members. Now we talked about also how wood is a natural material and how wood can move with changes in moisture in the environment. And this is an end uh, cut of a log and we know it's a natural um, material, when wood uh, gets wet, it's going to expand. It's going to absorb that water. And when wood dries out, it'll uh, it, um, shrink because it, it'll lose that water. So depending on the cut of the wood that you're getting, it will shrink radially and tangentially. And we'll look at this in this next example. So this is a two-by member where we have the um, member cut across here. Along the length of the stud, we're not going to see much movement at all when we have a change in the moisture content. We will, however, see a change tangentially, which is parallel here along this line, of 8% change 
and then half of that much radially. Now the good rule of thumb that we have or that, that you can use is that for every 4% moisture change, 4% moisture change, moisture content change, you're going to get a 1% change dimensional change. And this is shown right here. Um, this is also in our manual, NDS manual, we also have a chapter on uh, calculation for moisture content and, and change in dimension. Uh, but it, it's just this, the based on the rule of thumb, 1% change in dimension for every 4% change in moisture content. Now, you'll see that in sawn lumber and um, for those engineered wood products such as glue lamb beams that when they're manufactured, they're manufactured very dry, um, you won't see as much of a change in um, dimensional change because they are manufactured in very dry conditions. <clears throat> now when we also do uh, consider, we do our design of our connections, we also need to consider a wet service uh, factor in uh, depending on what our fabrication moisture content is and our in-service moisture content. And this is all based on, uh, I have it in the next slide, based on a 19% moisture content. This moisture, this wet service factor is not to be confused with when we're dealing with the design of glue lamb beams that has a different uh, wet service moisture content. This is strictly for connections of sawn lumber, um, all in Chapter 10 if you're dealing with the 2012 NDS or Chapter 11 if you're dealing with the 2015 NDS. But this covers all connections for sawn lumber, structural laminated lumber, timber poles, timber piles, structural composite lumber. It applies for this wet service factor. Now when we have a fabrication or, and an in-service moisture content, we have a wet service moisture content of 1.5. So there's no change in the moisture uh, content of the, um, of the um, wood member. There's no change. But when we're dealing with a fabrication moisture content of above 19% and then in service of above moisture content, we have a reduction depending on whether or not we have withdrawal, we're dealing with design of a withdrawal connection or a lateral load connection. And then even more so is if we're fabricating where it's very saturated above 19% moisture content and then in service it shrinks down. So the wood is going to shrink down because it's drying out. Um, that will cause some challenges with a connection and we'll look at that a little bit more closely. So for the lateral loads, we do get a break. Let me go back to that. And this is for 0.4 of lateral loads if the diameter of your fastener is greater than a quarter of an inch. If it's less than a quarter of an inch, we only have to reduce it by 30%. In other words, it's 0.7 for fasteners that are less than a quarter of an inch. And that goes back to having smaller diameter fasteners, spreading them across the uh, surface of the wood member. You get a lot of advantages for using smaller diameter fasteners than you do with larger diameter fasteners. Now for those lateral load fasteners that are greater than a quarter of an inch, this can be increased to 1.5 if we have only one fastener or if we have two or more fasteners all in the row or if we're using a split splice plate. And this makes sense because we're talking about uh, when there are conditions where you're first fabricating that member or the connection in a very moist um, moisture content and then it dries out. So there are sh issues when that perpendicular um, up and down the wood is going to shrink quite well, not quite a bit, but it's going to shrink in this direction. So you're not affected when all these fasteners are all, all, all in the row or when these fasteners are, not, um, are on two different plates. And we'll look at that in the next few, um, in the next slide. One thing I want to point out is this is for, in the handout, it, this did say table 10.3.3, um, but um, since we're dealing with uh, 
2015 NDS, which Lori will mention in the next few slides, I changed this to Table 11. <clears throat> There was a chapter added in the 2015 NDS, a chapter 10 for cross-laminated timber. That's why there was a, a renumbering of those chapters. So I mentioned about end conditions and um, connections all in a row and being the shrinkage that can occur. What happens here is if we have a connection here, we have two beams that are connected. You can see a, a splice right here and they're connected here at the top and then connected here at the bottom and then connected to the column or the post. Well, what can happen is because wood can shrink and it will shrink up and down the um, wood member, what happens is splitting can occur at this location because it's held in place at the top and it has no way to move vertically when the wood shrinks. So a better solution to that is to have a member, if you're um, transferring load across a member, you can have a connection at the top and then the connection in the bottom. So then when and if this wood does shrink vertically, it is not restrained by a side plate and then it can shrink freely. The other alternative to this is to provide Going back to this, you could provide a vertical slot to allow for these bolts to move vertically and um, that way you can still have this side plates and then the wood can move, the beam can move vertically by, with those vertical slots. And uh, this is a condition where there is a bolt here at the top and then a bolt here at the, oh, sorry, bolt here at the bottom and what happened is, you can even see it here, is when this member was in place, there was some shrinking that did occur and it's held up here at the top and we rely mostly probably in this condition on bearing of the wood beam on the bottom of this bucket or this hanger and um, you can see there's a shadow here where the beam actually withdrew or raised up because it was being held here. So shrinkage. Here's a better connection where we have this hanger, we have bolts here and here, it's not with strain up here and um, in this condition here you can see that there's vertical slots in this connection to allow for the movement of that wood member to um, move with the um, change in the moisture content of the wood member. Another thing we need to consider when we're in contact with cementitious material like concrete or masonry, we need to avoid direct contact with those types of materials because the moisture, we know that con concrete and masonry are very porous, it'll absorb water, we want to avoid that water to um, avoid any contact of that with indirect contact with the wood and this is a code requirement as well. Um, this shows a plate on the bottom that separates it from the concrete and the end, I don't know if you can see it, there's a gap at the end of that wood beam from the concrete wall. Here's another condition that um, has, it separates it from the concrete, um, again allowing that and then um, this happens to be a condition where there's going to be some movement in the horizontal direction, they slotted it for longitudinal uh, movement. So considering how these wood members are resisting the loads and building that into the connection. Another issue here where we have uh, a seated connection to the end of this masonry wall, uh, there's lifted up from the concrete or the masonry and another connection here where you can see they did not provide any kind of gap. This is here at the end of the Gulam beam, that doesn't look like a half an inch. What will happen is moisture will build up in there and then it will wick up into the end of that wood Gulam beam. So it is required by code to provide at least a half an inch air gap between the wood member and the masonry or concrete. Here's another condition where this is just purely a bucket where no weave bolts were provided, rain or moisture will flow down and just build up within this and um, cause some challenges out, may cause decay and moisture entrapment, no weep holes provided. 
for that moisture to leak out. This is another connection where they provided proper separation from the concrete. Again, those end conditions of the wood member, the post um, was separated from the concrete. <clears throat> And this is a condition we know that um, this happens a lot of times where, where we've got a post down to a foundation and then maybe later on there's a slab, patio slab that's built later on after the fact. Um, we want to make sure we know what's going to be out in the end environment. What will happen is, although this was originally separated from the concrete, the slab will now be poured after and would cause some issue because the concrete um, will absorb water. It'll even act like a bucket around this post and um, cause some challenges out in the field. Whereas this, where the foundation was, um, the slab was poured around that and um, column base and providing separation from the wood member from the concrete. Now we have another poll question coming up, Suzanne. Yes, we do. Uh, proper detailing of wood members and connections exposed to interior and exterior environment include uh, redirecting the water flow around the connection, separating the wood and co from concrete and masonry, protecting the ingrain, incorporating weep poles, or E, all of the above. So go ahead and place your vote. You've got about almost 70% in so far. And there is one very, very clear answer. We made another record. <laughs> I know. Well, maybe you should make them harder, Michelle. I know. <laughs> Who are going to make it harder? <laughs> OK, so we've hit 80%. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share it. Awesome. And you guys are as awesome. you can see, we've got a 98% there. Man, we have an awesome audience. <laughs> now, maybe I'll throw in a trick question. If we're, and you can't answer, but I'll, you can discuss it amongst yourself. When you're in the exterior environment and we have the wood members, there are two things that we should probably specify of the wood members for that exposed environment, and it's exposed to the weather. And the answer is natural decay or natural durable wood, natural decay resistant wood, or preservative treated wood. Very, uh, very important if it's going to be exposed to moisture in the exterior environment. Okay, so the answer to this one was though all the above. Very good. Okay, now we'll get into some connection hardware and fastener systems. There are a lot of types of connectors out there, a lot of type of proprietary fasteners that are available. Um, we'll just go over some of the basic ones here um, that are out uh, available for you as designers. Now, stepping back a little bit, this is the real connection design of wood elements is the real, it, it's, it provides a real good opportunity for engineers to interact with architects to be very um, creative in their approach to a connection. And engineers are probably cringing at me saying that. <laughs> but it's a way for an opportunity for the structure to shine through and to be of assistance to the architect and the building officials also, when they look at these connections, to have a very good positive impact on what a structure is going to look like and what the built environment is going to look like. And there's a lot of solutions that are available. One is the all wood solution. This has been around for a long time, for um, used really successfully, um, very practical solutions to connecting wood members to wood members using an all wood system. There, there, there's very good uh, using CNC, very accurate technology for milling these type of connections or creating, building these type of connections. Um, they've been over a hundred years in use. And as I mentioned, CNC technology, which is computer numerical control milling technology um, for these joints with pre-drilled holes. 
Um, the Timber Frames Guild, tfguild.org, has a lot of information that's available. They have a free resource that's available called Standard for Design of Timber Frame Structures and Commentary that gives you some design examples. Um, but be, be aware that you will need to use the NDS also to design the connections, but this will provide some assistance with designing those connections. And um, there's a lot of research that's been going, that's been, uh, uh, that is available for these type of connections. We have a, a structure magazine article that gets, uh, get, can provide more detail. Now, one of the huge advantages about these timber connections, all timber peg um, wood connections, is, is, is in fact that it is in all wood condition. And when we do look at changes in moisture or even temperature when you're dealing with metal to wood, because it's an all wood connection, they will move and perform all the same. You're not going to get changes because of you have a very rigid or steel connection to a wood connection that's not going to move in temperature. Wood will has um, um, will not expand or contract because of temperature as steel will, and um, so that whole dynamics of an all wood connection is um, provides a very good connection because they will move in, in the environment the same. Other types of connections that we have that are covered in the NDS are nails, staples, wood screws, uh, metal plate connectors are not covered in the NDS but we have lag screws and bolts that are covered in the NDS. All of these are available. Now when you look at these metal plate connected connectors this by itself follows that philosophy of spreading all the connectors across the surface of the wood and having a lot of little connectors. That's one thing that's good, great about those connectors. We also have, um, and those can be used for wood-to-wood -wood connections, um, all of those noted there. And L'Oreal mentioned later in the presentation about cross-laminated timber, which is new to the 2012 uh, NDS, or I'm sorry, new to the 2015 NDS, and these are some typical fasteners that are used for those. Um, we have self-tapping screws that are used that come very at various lengths, and also prefabricated connectors. This is an example of a connection by a manufacturer, connector manufacturer, that are available for CLT connections. Um, and then these just show some typical applications. They're pretty basic angles uh, with screws connecting panels to panels connections. For those that are interested in finding out design information, and Lori may get into this later, is for uh, non-proprietary connectors, we have bolts and lag screws, wood screws, nails and spikes, split rings, shear plate connectors, drip holds, drip pin, pins that are all covered in the NDS. There are also some ER evaluation reports that cover these types of connectors also. And then I think it's time to hand it off to Lori. All right. I should be unmuted at this point. You are. I can hear All you. All right, good. <laughs> and show my screen. All right. So I'm going to pick up where Michelle left off and start by uh, discussing the connection techniques. Uh, I'm going to focus more on the number crunching side, uh, talk about some of the equations, where they are in the NDS, and uh, some, some other things that you'll want to be aware of when you're using the standard to design your, your connections. So the 2015 NDS is the latest and greatest version. It is referenced in the 2015 IBC. So those of you that aren't on it yet, you have this to look forward to. Uh, it is an ANSI accredited standard. AWC is an ANSI accredited standards developer. 
uh, and our Wood Design Standards Committee is our consensus body that uh, develops the NDS and, and makes revisions to it uh, as necessary. So this is, all goes through a uh, ANSI pro accredited process and we are audited to ensure compliance. So the 2012 NDS had the following chapter layout. And if you guys go into the 2015 NDS, you'll see that it's laid out, there's the same number of chapters, but there's been some shuffling around. Uh, the shear wall and diaphragms chapter in the 2012 NDS was pretty much a one-line chapter that told you for shear wall and diaphragm design, go to our special design provisions for wind and seismic. Uh, instead of having a whole chapter devoted to that, we've moved it up into chapter one. So there, that charging language is now in the beginning. Um, but because we added cross-laminated timber, that's now chapter 10 and connections uh, and the special loading and fire chapters have gotten shifted uh, accordingly. So chapter 11 is the chapter that deals with your mechanical connections. Uh, so table 1131 is the table most of you guys are familiar with this format. It shows our adjustment factors for connections and it accommodates both ASD and LRFD design. Uh, you, you can see that there are provisions for dowel type fasteners, so that's your bolts, lag screws, wood screws, nails, and things of that nature. Uh, we also have provisions for split ring and shear plate uh, connectors, uh, timber rivets, and spike grids. And remember, these, these are, uh, this is the new chapter numbering for the 2015 NDS. If you were to look in the 2012 NDS, this table would be in chapter 10. So just be aware that uh, it has moved. Dowel fasteners are now in chapter 12. And this can be used for any dowel shaped fastener. Uh, and we have both lateral and withdrawal provisions for uh, the, the fasteners you see listed here. Um, the types of fasteners are defined in the standards, so there, there are production standards related to um, bolts, lag screws, nails, and those are qualified in the, the language for each section. So you will want to ensure that if you're specifying a lag screw that it conforms with the appropriate ANSI ASME standard. Uh, and same for nails, they're going to be governed by ASTM F1575. Uh, the, the first thing you'll come across is the dowel fastener withdrawal. So withdrawal is going to be calculated based on the penetration of the fastener. Uh, and you'll see it's calculated on the a W basis. W is going to be per inch of fastener penetration. And we've got an example later that we're going to go through that clarifies this a little. Uh, if you're using a threaded fastener, it's going to be based on the penetration of the threads, not the full penetration. So if you, if you have an unthreaded portion that's also penetrating, that's not going to be considered to provide any withdrawal, uh, for, for example, from a lag screw. And you can see we've got equations for lag screws, wood screws, and smooth shank nails. Uh, with the upcoming changes to ASTM F1575 for ring shank uh, helical nails, I'm sure we will be uh, adjusting the future versions of the NDS uh, appropriately, but the, these are, those are what you can see in the 2015 NDS now, these equations here. And one thing to be aware of is if you are using nails or wood screws, <coughs> they are considered to have no withdrawal capacity in the end grain. So we have uh, different yield modes for lateral, laterally loaded connections uh, that you'll see in the NDS. Mode one is a bearing dominated uh, yield of the wood fibers. And you can see we've got mode 1M, which means that the main member is the one that's yielding, and 1S, which is the side member. Uh, 
you'll need to make sure you check all of these modes for for lateral, it's not just the ones that you like the best. Uh, mode two, you'll see, is only going to apply to single shear connections. It's not going to apply to double shear. Uh, so this is uh, based on where the fastener pivots and you have some localized crushing of the wood fibers. So mode 3 is uh, another one where we have both a, a 3M and 3M or 3M and 3S for main and side member. Uh, this involves the fastener yielding in one plastic at one point, forming a plastic hinge, and you will have a bearing dominated yield of the wood fibers as well. And mode four is when you form two plastic hinges uh, with additional bearing of the wood, um, dominated yield of the wood fibers. So when you go into Chapter 12 and you look at the uh, equations that govern yield modes, you'll see one of the requirements is that you need to know the Dow bearing strength, or the F sub E. Uh, we do provide a table for F sub E based both on the fastener size and the orientation of the load. Uh, so you'll see in, in the ch Table 12.3.3, for fasteners that are less than one quarter inch in diameter, the F sub E is going to be independent of the loading orientation. So the F sub E will be the same regardless of a parallel or a perpendicular to grain loading. However, when you get to fasteners that are larger than a quarter inch, you'll see that, that we have different values for perpendicular to grain loading and parallel to grain loading. Uh, these these F sub E uh, values are based uh, on the specific gravity as well as the diameter of the fastener uh, for the perpendicular to grain loading. So we have two basic elements of a connection. We've got the bearing of the wood or whatever material we're connecting. We also have the bending strength of the fasteners. Uh, bending strength of or bending yield strengths of nails and spikes are determined in accordance with ASTM F1575, uh, and you can check Appendix I of the NDS for some additional uh, information on those bending strengths. Um, so th those are something you'll want to be aware of. We also have some information in TR12 on fastener uh, bending yield values. So you can see this is uh, out of Appendix I in the NDS. Uh, so our, the FYB values are provided based on the fastener type uh, as well as the diameter. We have yield limit equations in Table 1231A. So we've got four yield mode, four modes of failure with six yield equations. Uh, for single and double shear. And I went through these uh, previously, so um, I just want you to be aware that there are some equations that do not apply to double shear connections, so that's why you don't see them in the double shear column. So mode 2 uh, and mode 3M do not occur in double shear connections. Uh, these equations can be used for wood-to-wood -wood connections, but also for uh, any other material, as long as you know the, the properties uh, that are required in the inputs. So you can use them for wood-to-steel, wood-to-concrete, uh, and we'll talk about in TR12 uh, some additional values for stainless steel and aluminum that we've come out with in a, a recent revision of TR12. So once you run through all of these equations, the lowest uh, yield Z value, that will be your connection capacity. And these are, again, the equation, the inputs for the equations, these yield limit equations that you'll see. Uh, the reduction term R sub D that you see uh, in table, that re references table 1231B, 
Um, that reduces the values calculated using uh, approximate estimates of the nominal proportional limit design values. So these, these reduction terms uh, are based on the angle of load as well as the diameter. And you will also need these if you're using the equations in TR12. So you want to be aware that this reduction term is applied to both the NDS and the TR12 yield limit equations. We have some nice figures in Chapter 12 that uh, give you some information on the terms for the geometry. So, you know, sometimes even I'll get confused, uh, you know, which way is end, which is edge distance. So take a look at, uh, at these, these pictures if you're unclear about what counts as spacing between bolts in a row and spacing between rows of bolts or the loaded versus unloaded edge distances because these all will affect the capacity of your connection and you need to be aware that there are requirements for end distances and edge distances. We want to minimize the possibility of splitting in our connections. So with these end and edge distance requirements that are presented in the NDS, uh, that's how we try to do that with, uh, with the geometry of the connection. So you can see again that it's the end and edge distance requirements are going to be based on the diameter of the fastener, uh, as well as if it's loaded perpendicular to grain or parallel to grain. And again, here's some additional spacing requirements for fasteners in a row and then requirements for spacing between rows. So you will want to be aware of these requirements. There are quite a few, um, and they are, but they are important. We also have requirements for spacing between outer rows of bolts, uh, and this is to help minimize cross-grain shrinkage of the member. Um, the there's additional information in the commentary that discusses that limiting the maximum distance between the outer rows of fasteners on the same splice plate will avoid splitting uh, that can occur, and Michelle talked about that, right? We don't want to have uh, unnecessary restraint throughout the height of the member because that will uh, induce sh uh, stress as the member shrinks. Uh, there is a note that if you have special detailing that's provided to accommodate this cross-grain shrinkage of the wood member, that you can vary from that spacing requirement of less than uh, five inches for the outer rows of bolts. But you will want to be aware that you want to accommodate uh, any shrinkage that could occur during the life of the member. So here's our fourth poll question, and I'll turn it over to, to Suzanne for this one. Okay, the NDS yield limit equations are used to determine the lateral capacity of connections, the withdrawal capacity of connections, the lateral and withdrawal capacity of connections, or none of the above. And this one's going to be a little bit closer, Lori. I can already, already tell you the results. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. I'll give you guys a few more seconds. And we're at about 60%. Everybody else needs to get out there and vote. Okay, you got two more seconds. And I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And Lori, I will let you tell everybody what the correct answer is because okay. we've got just over a slight majority have picked A, but I don't okay. think they have a clear response. Okay, so the yield limit equations are only for the lateral capacity of the connections. There are withdrawal equations, but they are not based on the yield limit equations. They're, they're going to be separate. So you'll want to ensure that for lateral capacity, you use the yield limit equations, and for withdrawal, you use the appropriate withdrawal equations. Like, hey, look, it's a full. 
you guys you guys asked for a tougher question, so hopefully that one was a little harder. Uh, Appendix E of the NDS has some additional information uh, specifically related to groups of fasteners. It is a, a non-mandatory appendix because it's not going to apply to every structure, but uh, if you have uh, fastener groups that are closely spaced, you want to ensure that you run these checks. Uh, for some, those of you that do a lot of steel design, these are probably pretty familiar uh, concepts to you. So we have a net section tension capacity check, uh, a row tear out capacity check, and a group tear out capacity check. And we also provide example problems in Appendix E that deal with staggered rows of bolts as, and single rows of bolts, as well as a row of split ring fasteners. Uh, not, not everyone is uh, familiar with what split rings are. They, they're generally used in slightly larger members, uh, and they, you can get a very high capacity connection with a split ring fastener. So if you guys are struggling to make your connection work using you know, the more traditional bolts, uh, you may want to look into something like a split ring or a shear plate uh, for your connection. So I want to talk about the dowel diameter because we have two different ones that we talk about. We have a D or a full body uh, unthreaded section of the fastener diameter and then we have a D sub R which is the reduced body or a th the threaded section. So here's uh, from Appendix L. We see that D is going to be the unthreaded section and D sub R is the threaded section or the it's also known as the root diameter and those uh, come into play based on the where the location of the threads are with relation to the shear plane so if your threaded length of your fastener is less than one-fourth of the main member you would use the full diameter of the fastener, the unthreaded portion. Uh, and this would apply for whether the main member is significantly larger than the side member or if they're about the same size. Uh, so the main member for bolted connections is, is considered to be the member which is applying the load. It's not necessarily the thicker member. Uh, if you have fasteners with a tapered tips, like a nail or a screw, uh, the main member is the one that contains the point of the fastener, the tip of the fastener. So if you've got your shear plane passing through the threaded section of a bolt, you'll use that reduced body diameter or that root diameter, D sub R. And if you go into the NDS Chapter 12 and you look up the tables that uh, have the yield values figured out for you so you don't have to use the equations, you want to be aware that there is an assumption that D sub R is used. So we are being slightly more conservative, uh, so D sub R is used for the tabulated values because we're assuming that the shear plane passes through the threads. If you have a connection where the shear, the shear plane is passing through the unthreaded portion and it's less than, again, that one quarter of the thickness of the main member, then your connection may have a slightly higher value than what is in the, the table. So if you run a, a check uh, with the equations and you try to compare it to the table, they may not match up. So that could be why, or you, or you just calculated the numbers wrong. Um, so as Michelle mentioned, for the first time ever in the 2015 version of the NDS, we have provisions for cross-laminated timber. Uh, so the connections, uh, the provisions for the connections chapter all had to be revised to accommodate this. So uh, we have a new section that's applicable for lag screw withdrawal from the narrow edge of the CLT. So that would be, you know, the top, the bottom, or the left or right edge. So for lag screws loaded in withdrawal from the narrow edge, the end grain factor, C sub EG, uh, is 0 0.75, and that's going to be applicable regardless of the actual grain orientation. 
Uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to predict exactly where that fastener, we, we may detail it to go directly into the, the center of the panel, and when we get out to the site, we may see that it's probably not in that lamination. Uh, so regardless of the actual grain orientation, we apply that C sub EG factor. Uh, it, it can be a bit of, uh, it can be conservative, but again, we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the field. We, we know that, you know, the, the best laid plans can sometimes be undone by a contractor in a hurry. So you want to be aware that the, the end grain factor is applicable for lag screws. Now for wood screws and nails and spikes, that is not any different than the previous provisions for non-CLT applications. We, we do not allow withdrawal con conditions from the end grain laminations of CLT for wood screws or for nails and spikes. Uh, so you want to be aware that there's no capacity for nail uh, and screw withdrawal from end grain. Uh, however, where we have side grain, you can see uh, that that is permitted. So in this, this uh, figure on the right here, where we show the, the fasteners in the side grain, you can have withdrawal from the side grain, but not the end grain. So be aware that that, it, that distinction does exist, and you'll want to ensure that you have careful detailing to ensure that the fasteners are actually going into the side grain and they're not loaded in end grain of CLT. Uh, we also added some new sections to address the dowel bearing strengths for fasteners installed in cross-laminated timber. Uh, so for, for fasteners that are installed in the, the face of the panel, the dowel bearing strength is going to be based on the direction of loading with respect to the grain orientation of the CLT ply at the shear plane. So the, the outermost CLT ply, ply at your shear plane. Uh, for fasteners that are installed in the narrow edge, the dowel bearing strength uh, perpendicular to the grain is going to be uh, applicable where the fastener diameter is greater than a quarter inch and it's uh, intended to account for that end grain. Uh, again, we've got that presence of that end grain in the bearing. And we also have end and edge distance requirements. Uh, so fasteners if that would not normally comply with the NDS provisions uh, for end and edge distance of an individual lamination will be able to comply with if you take into account the entire CLT panel. So if you've got a, a CLT panel of three one and a half inch laminations, its total thickness is four and a half inches. Um, so meeting, you may not be able to meet the edge distance requirements for that one and a half inch lamination, uh, but you will likely be able to meet it with the four and a half inch dimension. So you want to be aware that you can use the, the full width of the panel. So one thing that you do need to be aware of uh, is the assumption that when we, when we have our yield value or our yield equations for uh, fasteners that we've used previously, we've had the assumption that we have uniform bearing across the cross-section. Uh, CLT, that's not true. We have non-uniform bearing because the orientation of the grain changes as you go through the thickness of the panel. So we use reduced bearing lengths to account for the uh, perpendicular gr to grain orientations in the crossing laminations and, and the fastener penetrates those multiple laminations. So what do I mean by uh, a reduced bearing length? So here's a, a brief example. Uh, we have a half inch bolt into a three ply Southern Pine CLT that's got one and a half inch laminations. And you can see that our main member has a four and a half inch thickness, three times one and a half. However, we need to adjust the perpendicular to grain section. So that in this equation is going to be that T sub two. 
We adjust it by multiplying it by the FE perpendicular over the FE parallel for that uh, given connection. So for southern yellow pine, we have a specific gravity of 0 0.55, and you can see that our parallel to grain loading for a half-inch diameter bolt is going to be uh, 6,150 psi. The perpendicular to grain value for that half inch would be 3,650. So using that adjustment factor, we go from uh, in our original L sub M to our adjusted value, and you see we lose 0.6 inches in our, in our adjustment. So that, that accounts for that reduced bearing capacity in the perpendicular to grain lamination compared to the parallel to grain. Uh, and that, that way we can take we can still use the, the equations we're familiar with, uh, but we do need to account for that variation in the grain throughout the cross section. Uh, as I mentioned, there are slightly different uh, rules in play for end distance, edge distance, and fastener spacing requirements. So figure 12i is a brand new figure. Uh, that shows the requirements for fasteners in the narrow edge of CLT. Uh, and these, again, are based on the CLT cross-section dimensions as opposed to the individual laminations. So for lag screws that are loaded laterally, now this is for lateral loading. We already talked about withdrawal loading. Uh, for lag screws that are loaded laterally in the narrow edge of the CLT, uh, we need to, in addition uh, of use for using the, sorry, I lost my place here. Uh, so we need to, in addition, we need to apply an end grain factor of 0.67 for any end grain or edge based on the diameter of the fastener. So if we've got, uh, regardless of if it's in the edge and the fastener is greater than a quarter inch, we need to apply that end grain factor of 0 0.67. Um, it would theoretically would apply to screws or nails uh, of any dimension for that, that less than one quarter inch, greater than one quarter inch, um, it's going to apply to any. But the, the NDS doesn't tabulate lateral design values for, for wood screws and nails uh, with a diameter larger than one quarter inch. Uh, so there, there's little practical application for that. All right, so now we're going to move into technical report 12. Uh, TR-12 provides some background as well as a derivation of a mechanics-based approach for calculating lateral connection capacity uh, that's used in the NDS. The NDS equations are based on an energy approach or an energy-based model, and TR-12 uses a mechanics-based model. Uh, you will get the same answer in the end. It's two roads to, to the same destination. But TR-12 has some additional flexibility uh, beyond what the NDS has. The NDS requirements uh, assume that the members are uh, touching, uh, that the, the shear plane uh, is the, of each member has no gap. TR-12 the, has equations that will accommodate gaps between the members. And in the latest revision of TR-12, we also added some equations that will allow you to connect wood to members with hollow cross sections. So if you have uh, you know, a, a hollow steel member that you want to anchor your wood to, this will allow you uh, to use these equations to do that. So, when you go into TR-12, you'll see three different tables. This is the first one. This is for when you're connecting members that have solid cross sections. The second table is when you're assuming that the main member is a solid member and the side member is hollow. 
and you can see we have our little illustrations on the right side of the page. So if you're unsure of, of the configuration, uh, that's there to, to give you a little bit of assistance. Um, TR12 is based on a quadratic formula, right? Remember that from, from our good old Algebra 2 class, Algebra 1? Uh, so you'll see that P equals negative B plus B squared minus 4AC over A. Uh, and that's, so that's based on a quadratic rather than the nonlinear equation that's used in the NDS. So it can be a little more user friendly. And then table 1-3 is when we have a hollow main member and solid side members. And as I mentioned, there are uh, provisions in TR12 that will allow you to have connections with gaps between the members, or if you just have something between the members that has no bearing capacity. So, for example, for whatever reason, if you had a, you know, a piece of foam insulation that was separating your, your two wood members, uh, compared to the wood, that foam probably has very little bearing capacity, so you would neglect that. Um, and you could use the, the gap provisions in TR12 to calculate the capacity. We also have uh, some equations that deal with the tapered tip uh, fasteners, so nails, uh, wood screws, lag screws, um, and the, the length of the tapered tip in the NDS is defined as E, not to be confused with your modulus of elasticity, this is a different E, uh, but the tapered tip does not count towards the bearing length in the TR12 tapered tip equations. So as you can see uh, in this little illustration, it shows that as we get towards the end of that taper, the bearing, uh, the bearing becomes uh, non-uniform. So we have equations in here, and I would really recommend that you guys look at these equations once and then never use them again, because they can get a little ugly. And uh, you'll see when we do an example later that using the NDS approximation for that tapered tip uh, is less than 1% different than using these big, terrible, expanded equations. So these equations are available in TR12, but uh, I really would recommend that you don't use them unless you have a specific purpose, um, because they, they aren't going to give you a much different answer than the NDS uh, simplifications, uh, but they will make you do a lot more work. So as I mentioned, TR12, these are, are mechanics-based uh, derivations of the equations, and they will give you the same results as an NDS-based, uh, as the NDS energy-based approach. One thing you want to be aware of is the equations in TR12 are calculating P, and in the NDS, we calculated Z. So to go from P to Z, you need to go into the NDS table, 1231B, and divide P by R sub D, and that will give you the NDS Z basis. And I just found out, just before we got on this call today, that the TR12 appendix has gone live on our website, and that's going to provide some additional information for uh, different materials. So uh, here's... Uh, what you, when you go into that equation, or I'm sorry, into that appendix, uh, you'll see inputs for the various equations in TR12. So we've expanded it from previous editions. Uh, we have Dow bearing values for wood, steel, concrete, uh, as well as stainless steel and aluminum. And for varying fastener materials, we have uh, Dow bending values. So the NDS provided them for uh, certain fasteners, but we've expanded that in this TR12 appendix. So we have uh, steel as well as stainless steel bolts and lag screws. Uh, we have low to medium carbon steel nails, and we have hardened steel nails, which are going to be your post frame ring shank nails, those, those big uh, post frame nails they would fall under the hardened steel uh, nails uh, heading. So
So here's our first example problem. This one is for a withdrawal. Um, we have a one quarter inch diameter, two and a half inch long lag screw that's connecting two two by southern yellow pine members. So using our equation, we can plug in our G of 0 0.55 and our one quarter inch diameter or we can pull it out of NDS table 12.2a. Uh, you get the same answer either way. And we need to calculate the penetration into the main member for the withdrawal capacity. So we go into the NDS appendix L, and that gives our lag screw dimensions. And we see that our penetration is equal to the screw length minus the length of the side member minus the length of the tip. So we have 0 0.84 inches of penetration into the main member. Multiplying that by our W, which is 260 pounds per inch of penetration, you'll see that we get an unadjusted capacity of 219 pounds. Then you'll need to make sure you apply the adjustment factors that we talked about that are in table 1131, and that'll give you your adjusted W prime value that you'll use for your connection. So our next problem, this one is going to be based on the TR12 uh, lateral equations. We're going to calculate the unadjusted Z for a half inch diameter bolt that's connecting two two by Douglas fir larch members with a one inch gap between them. Uh, we're assuming that both members are, are loaded parallel to grain, so that gives us a case of theta of one. So here are the, the givens. We know that we've assumed that um, our, we have a half inch diameter bolt that's given. Our FE parallel value of 5,600 PSI is coming straight out of the NDS. And so we're able to calculate our QS and QM. And conveniently enough for this example, they are going to be the same, um, as well as our L sub S and our L sub M, right? Because we're assuming that the bolt is passing through both members. Uh, and again, our F sub YB is also in both TR12 in the TR12 appendix and in the NDS and our gap we said was one inch. So we substitute all of these values into the TR12 equations and we get our P values which you can see for each of the yield modes there and then we have to divide by R sub D and you see that our final value we get a Z of 323 pounds. All right, so example problem three has, it's gonna be kind of a two-parter. So the first part uh, we have, we wanna compare lateral Z values for a single shear nail connection at six diameters, eight diameters, 10 diameters, and 12 diameters of penetration and we're going to use the TR12 tapered tip equations, those ugly, ugly equations that I told you guys to look at once and then never use again. Uh, we're actually going to use them just, just for the, the sake of making a point here. Uh, so we assume that our main member has an F sub E of 4,700 PSI, so that's Douglas fir larch type material. Uh, and we're going to assume it's loaded parallel to grain. Our side member is uh, an ASTM A653 grade 33 steel side member, uh, 0.06 inches, and the F sub E is uh, 61,850. And our L sub M is going to be the penetration into the main member, and our L sub S is just our side member thickness. So assuming that we have these varying penetrations, you can see that the controlling mode of failure uh, doesn't change until we get down to that six diameters of penetration. So now if we go back and we use the NDS assumption, which is that the L sub M is the penetration 
minus one half of the length of the tapered tip. These are the values we get. So you can see the only one that comes out any different is 6D. The controlling mode of failure is the same. The only thing that changed was in the previous slide, our 6D had a Z of 79 pounds, and using the NDS assumption, we get a Z of 78 pounds. And for my money, that's not worth using those, those horrible, monstrous equations. Uh, so the, the NDS equation, the NDS assumptions will give you less than 1% uh, as for as many example problems as I ran when we were updating it, I couldn't ever get it to be more than 1% difference. So we have one more poll that I'll give it up for Suzanne. Thank you, Lori. Um, technical Report 12 provides a what kind of approach for calculating the capacity of laterally loaded connections? Mechanics-based, energy-based, a hybrid model, or none of the above? And the votes are coming in. I'll give it a few more seconds. We do have a majority, not a huge majority, though. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now and share that. So you can see 82% selected mechanics-based. All right. So I guess you guys were listening. The answer is A, it is a mechanics-based. So the NDS equations, as I mentioned, are based on uh, an energy model. And TR12 is a mechanics-based approach. So again, same, same final destination, just a different road to get there. So we'll get away from some equations now. I know that your heads may be, your heads are, are probably spinning a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about some design software that's out there so that you guys don't have to necessarily run all these numbers by hand every time you want to design a connection. So the Western Wood Products Association, the WWPA, has a lumber design suite uh, that you can go on their website to find out more and download. Uh, and they have, uh, unfortunately, they don't have provisions for wood to other materials, but for wood to wood connections, they have uh, a lot of availability for nails, bolts, wood screws, and lag screws. And they also have addition for uh, beam and joist design and post and stud design. So if you're interested, uh, that's a good program to check out. And it just plugs right into an Excel spreadsheet. So engineers love Excel, right? Uh, another option you have is the AWC Connections Calculator, and that can be found on our, our award-winning website here. Uh, the Quick Links also has a button there that allow you to jump to the calculators page. And the Connections Calculator, these screenshots are from the free web version of the calculator. But you can also download uh, an app. There is a, a small fee associated with the app, but it's available for both uh, iOS and Android systems. And it'll do all the things that our website ha does uh, on your phone. Uh, so it's all the, the web version here that I've got. It's all based on drop-down menus, and that's also true for the app version. Uh, you know, you can just drop you can click on the arrow and decide uh, which option suits your needs best. You know, allowable stress design, or LRFD, uh, various fastener types, if single shear, double shear connections. We can do all of that. So you start by submitting your initial values and then, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So once you submit your initial values, this next par portion of the table here uh, on the right side of the page will pop up, and you can select your main member, uh, your side member. Uh, so we have just about every species of wood that's listed in the NDS. 
uh, available in here, as well as a steel side member or connections to concrete. Um, our nails can be common, box, whatever you name it. Uh, we've also got lag screws, wood screws, bolts. Uh, we've got options for different load duration factors, wet service, end grain, temperature, all that good stuff. So the actual, once you hit this button that's calculate the connection capacity, this gives you the adjusted capacity, which is the Z prime. So that's uh, a benefit of using this over just going to the table in the NDS is that as long as you select all the, the correct load duration, wet service factors, all those, uh, this gives you the adjusted capacity. And so where can we get more information on, uh, on connection design? Oh, so I just got a note. Sorry, I did not realize this. I want to go back and restate. Our apps are now available for free. I, all right, good to know. Uh, so make sure you can check them out on our website and download them from there, and they're available for free. Uh, and we have the, again, the Connections app. We also have a Span Calculator app that's out there too. So those are pretty useful uh, if you're in the field especially. And so where can we get more information, uh, as if you guys didn't get inundated with enough? Uh, the 2012 NDS is, is a good uh, option, as well as the, the new 2015 NDS. Uh, and that's where the bulk of today's information came from. You know, uh, the NDS and TR12, there, there's no smoke and mirrors going on. We weren't hiding anything from you guys. Uh, so it's all in the standard. Uh, in the manual, in M44, there are special design considerations addressed for uh, mechanical connections, and that includes uh, examples for dowel fasteners and some split ring and shear plate connections, as well as timber rivets. Uh, they're not, timber rivets aren't especially popular in the United States. You see them a lot more in Canada, but if you guys want to start using them and, and making them more popular in the U.S., uh, please check it out. As I said, the 2015 NDS is the latest and greatest. Uh, if you're doing CLT connections, you have to use this version because it's not in the 2012. Uh, otherwise, most of the, the connection provisions are, are fairly similar. We do have some information on our website on timber rivets if you do want to use those. Uh, so you can check out our website here for technical papers on timber rivets uh, from various connections, uh, for, I'm sorry, from various sources uh, for seismic behavior, for uh, structural composite lumber, and we also have some info on suppliers of timber rivets uh, if you're not typically used to, to having those uh, sourced for your projects. We can help you find somebody who can provide them for you. Here's um, a couple of papers. The, the first is the load carrying behavior of steel to timber dowel connections. That's based on some research that was done out at Washington State University. Uh, we also have a link to some options for concealed connectors. Uh, so the, there are options where, you know, if you want to just have uh, the, the connectors hidden inside the wood, uh, Structure Magazine had a nice article on those, and there's additional information you can find on those. Uh, they are they're pretty nice in that you know they uh, from an architectural standpoint you don't have to look at the connectors. So for the architects in the group, it does give you an additional option uh, for your appearance of your of your members. So. If you guys take anything home with you today, it's, it's going to be what's on this slide. You want to make sure that whenever possible, you want to transfer loads in compression or bearing. Uh, wood, especially tension perpendicular to grain, wood does not like that. Um, so if you can transfer the loads using bearing or compression, that is going to be the, the best use of the material. You want to allow for dimensional changes that are going to occur in the wood. Uh, 
with in-service moisture cycling. So, you know, Michelle talked about that. You don't want to have unnecessary stresses developing because you've restrained the beam throughout the entire cross-section, and then when it goes to shrink, it starts splitting at the connections. It's bad news. Uh, we want to avoid the use of any details which induce tension perpendicular to grain. So, you know, we talked about hanging loads, uh, you know, s having lots of connectors that are not staggered and are acting as a wedge. Uh, we we want to make sure that we do everything we can to avoid tension perpendicular to grain because that is probably the worst way you could load wood. You want to avoid moisture entrapment, right? Wood loves water. If you get water in there, it's going to swell. Uh, it's going to decay. Uh, so we don't want to entrap moisture. So weep holes, flashing, uh, you know, proper moisture management is crucial with any building or, you know, any structure, but it is especially important with wood because you get too much moisture in there and the wood will decay. Uh, you want to ensure that you separate the wood from direct contact with masonry or concrete, right? So that using steel bearing plates, uh, ensuring that you maintain that half inch air gap. Um, so, you know, you want to ensure that, that the wood is not in direct contact with any masonry or concrete or cementitious materials in general. Uh, Eccentricity in joints, uh, if you can avoid it, it's, that's going to be your best bet. It can be hard to predict sometimes uh, how the wood's going to behave when it's loaded eccentrically, and then the number crunching can be a little tough. Uh, so when at all possible, avoid eccentricity in the joint. Uh, and you want to minimize the exposure of end grain, right? Remember that, the, that model with the straws. The end grain is the, the end of the straw. And if water is in contact with that end grain, it's just going to, the wood is going to want to pull it up into the straw. And it can cause swelling. It can cause splitting. Uh, it can cause decay. Uh, so you, you want to ensure that if you've got end grain, you have it protected, you know, end caps post caps, flashing, uh, there's a number of different ways that you can avoid that exposure of end grain, um, but you do want to be aware that it is something you, that can be detrimental to the, life sp uh, the lifespan of your wood. And uh, <laughs> we, we like to throw this in as this uh, next slide in as a little bit of lighthearted humor. Uh, you know, you thought connecting wood was complicated. Uh, this picture comes from uh, uh, a 12-ton multi-directional bracing connection node that was used in the Mellon Bank high-rise in Philadelphia. And it was detailed by hand by Mr. John Alonzo of Steel Graphics. So just keep that in mind that that wood is not necessarily the craziest material out there for us to connect, um, but we can keep it simple if possible. And just want to close it out. We've got uh, a, some pictures here of the various types of connections that you will see, you can see with wood. Uh, you know, we, we've come a long way from just mortise and tenon and, and nails and screws. So you can have uh, connectors in just about any geometry you can think of uh, and e incorporating steel into them, wood to steel connections. Uh, you can see we've got some where we've got some concealed connectors. Uh, so there's, there's a lot you can do and you can get custom made connections obviously uh, working with various uh, fabricators. So there, there's a lot you can do with uh, with wood connections. So with that, uh, I would like to bring Michelle back on. Lori, I'm going to jump in too and, oh, uh, and prompt buddy, you guys right. with some questions. We had a lot okay. of questions coming in while you all were uh, 
doing an excellent job with the uh, webinar. So thank you, Michelle and Lori, for a great job. Let me start well, off. Before, intern Go ahead. Before we start, the audience still needs to be on till uh, for 108 minutes, just to let them know to get their certificate. Oh yeah, thanks so. for that reminder. Um, so <laughs> folks, stick around. We've got plenty of questions to take us to the top of the hour. So um, uh, stick around till the top of the hour, and you'll get your your full credit. Um, let me take the first question because we had a lot of folks asking about print versions of the 2015 NDS and the <laughs> wood design package, and that goes to the printer next week. So uh, if you check back with us in December, you should be able to get a print version. For those of you who are were, were not aware, we also provide a free uh, view-only version of the 2015 NDS on our website, and so you'd be able to to uh, download that and take a look. Uh, Brian uh, is putting some links there in the chat box as well for for how you can uh, get to that. So if um, someone makes me presenter, I can show them where it's at. Oh, okay. Sorry. So uh, Michelle, while you're uh, getting set up to do that, we also had a question about uh, pneumatic nails. Can you? Talk a little bit about uh, pneumatic nails as opposed to what we show in the NDS and where folks can get more information about that. Let's see. Am I a presenter? I just made you presenter. All right. Awesome. So for nails, we do have a resource. Well, there is a resource that's available for, um, it's called iSanta, and the website is iSanta.org. They cover all types of nails. They also cover staples, and um, it's uh, the International Staple Nail and Tool Association, where you can obtain an ER report that provides all si all types of design parameters for nails other than what is in the NDS. Is that what you're? Uh... Yep, that's it. Okay. And um, Lori, let me throw this one back to you because it relates to TR12. Uh, latest question came in says, when designing connections with a gap, is there guidance um, with respect to estimating deflection of the connection? So the assumption uh, with the gap on TR12 connections is that the members do not deflect relative to each other. So there, there is not. Um, so the the assumption is that uh, with TR12 that the you know member all members that are plain remain plain uh, that old that old standby um, so that we are assuming that the there's the the bolt or fastener is not going to yield in that gap uh, so we don't have any provisions that will allow you to calculate a deflection based on deformation that occurs within that gap. Great. Great. Um, Michelle, back to you on um, um, dowel bending, uh, or uh, sorry, dowel bearing strength for plywood. Lori mentioned that for fasteners less than a quarter inch diameter, there are dowel bearing strengths in the NDS. Where do folks get information if the diameter is greater than a quarter inch? Yes, um, something greater. You can go to APA and they have a, I believe it's a technical note or a publication 825E that's available from their website. Their website is really easy to use. It's apawood.org. Um, if you're going to download any publications, you just create a username and password and then you can download they have a vast library of information, but the publication is 825E. Great, thanks. Lori, I'm going to uh, throw this one back to you and maybe have Michelle navigate there while you're talking uh, to the connections calculator. Mm -hmm. um, there were some questions about multiple fastener connections and uh, some of the adjustment factors that would go along with multiple fastener connections, since our calculator is based on single fastener uh, connections. Talk a little bit about uh, those limitations to our calculator, and I'll be glad to help with with some of those questions. Okay, well. yeah, so the, the, as Buddy mentioned, the connections calculator is only for a single connector. So if you have uh, multiple connectors, you'll want to defer to, uh, let's see, where is it, Appendix E is going to have some provisions. 
um, sorry, flipping through the flipping through the standard while I'm talking to you guys, as well as yeah, so group action but, factor. Yeah, yeah the, that's group right. Group action factor is going to be another one for multiple connections, and um, then end and edge distances aren't really covered uh, in the calculator either. So while right. some of the adjustments are covered, they are strictly for single uh, fastener connectors. Another question that came in that uh, I can address has to do with uh, does our dowel theory work if you've got steel between wood members? Let's say you've got a steel main member right. and wood side members. Absolutely. And our, yep, yeah. and, our, and our calculator actually handles that application as well. So that's another uh, option for you. Here's uh, the Appendix E. This is a 2015 NDS. Yeah, and Appendix E deals with um, stresses uh, in the wood member around the connection. So once you finish your connection design, you still have to check net section to make sure you've got enough wood member left uh, for it to handle the capacity of everything that's uh, that you've uh, designed the, the connection for, and, and that's one way that Appendix E uh, allows you to do that. All right, um, Lori, let me kick this one back to you. Uh, questions about what defining a main member versus a side member. So that's pretty easy with a threaded connector. Uh, right. Talk about and, that a little bit. Uh, and, and this was actually something that we debated a little bit while we were putting this, uh, putting this presentation together. Uh, so for a tapered tip member, uh, such as a, uh, you know, a nail or a lag screw, the main member is simply the member that contains the point of the fastener. Uh, Michelle, you pulling the uh, slide up that, that has yep. that there? All right, awesome. Um, for bolted connections, it's uh, a little a little less clear because we don't have uh, a member that is that's containing a point. So for bolted connections, uh, I think it's around slide 88, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the main member for bolted connections is the member that's applying the load. It's not necessarily the the thicker member. Um, so in this case, this top member, if it's applying the load, then that's the main member, and it's thinner than the other member. Yeah, and for bolted connections, it's probably not going to make a, a huge difference. I think you're going to end up with the same uh, result uh, either way, but for your um, threaded fasteners, threaded. it's always going to be um, the uh, member holding the, the tip. Uh, which leads me to another question that was asked, and that is about uh, double, shear, double shear nail connections. And so somebody was asking, can you still do that? And the answer is yes. Uh, per uh, NDS, and let me get to my 2015 version, um, uh, chapter 12 now um, for nails in the nails section and okay. nails and spikes that's 12.1.6.5 um, and because we require a minimum penetration depth in the main member and in this case if you have a double shear connection with a nail the point is going to be in that third member a lot of cases that third side member let's say if you've got a truss repair with plywood side members uh, that third member doesn't necessarily have uh, enough thickness to meet those penetration requirements we give an exception in 12165 that allows you to, to drive that nail through uh, the uh, other side of that uh, that uh, third member and clinch the nail over and when you do that in accordance with the provisions of that exception then you can get your double shear capacity for 
nails, and so that was another one we want to make sure that we uh, that we touched on. Here. Yeah, the, so the it's right, there. right below the figure. And then here. Yep. Good questions. Yeah, I'm still looking through here to see what what else we've got. Yeah, so somebody um, again talked about Appendix E and the fact that uh, for local stresses at connection, that section, uh, that that type of thing, we have to make sure that that's accounted for because those can be rather uh, significant. All right, so where are we at on the on our website? If you're not familiar with our website, it's awc.org, and there's a lot of the links that we were talking about is through this quick links. There's the calculators, the publications um, that goes to that. And the, the one thing about the free uh, publication on our website, it does not include the commentary. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, the commentary will be coming out in uh, the electronic version that can be purchased and the printed version that will be available in December. Um, the other question that I see here or comment that came up was about other software tools and uh, Woodworks software. If you go to um, our okay. calculators and software page, um, does also have a connections module uh, as part of the Woodworks software suite. Okay. And so uh, not only do they do the beam and column design but uh, and shear wall design, but they have a uh, connections module as well. And it does do multiple uh, fastener connections, uh, does some nice detailing, some nice uh, actual steel design uh, as well. So uh, just and there's be aware a, of that. A US and Canadian version too. Right, right. All right. Looking for a few more questions rolling in here. The um, to clarify, the connection calculator on the website does not account for gaps like we do in TR12. So it does assume that the um, the members are in contact, uh, similar to what we do uh, in the NDS tables. Um, another question that commonly comes up has to do with the um, penetration depth uh, or penetration adjustment factor in the NDS tables versus the uh, yield mode equations that Lori uh, mentioned. And so a, a clarification there uh, for those of you who use the tables uh, to get your design values for connections. The, there are footnotes to the tables, uh, to those tabulated values that account for cases where you may not have a certain minimum penetration that's required. However, the yield mode equations already account for those penetration uh, requirements. So if you're using the yield mode equations and coming up with an answer per your spreadsheet or uh, even uh, per the calculator that we have on our website, um, you don't have to take an additional penetration depth adjustment. Um, so be aware of that nuance as well. Well, again, if you're using tabulated values, you can you will need to use that adjustment if you don't have the appropriate penetration uh, just because of the the um, restrictions that we have on tabulating all different types of uh, variables in the in the tables so another question that came in had to do with the assumptions on um, the Dow um, bending strengths for certain fasteners and so let me point out Appendix I of the NDS. Um, 
and um, for larger diameter fasteners like bolts, um, the that dowel um, or fastener bending yield strength is based on an average of tensile yield and tensile ultimate of uh, those larger diameter dowels. For the smaller diameter fasteners like nails and wood screws, um, back when this yield theory was put together, uh, some testing was done to come up with some of those uh, typical bending yield values. And so there's a table, Michelle, if you want to uh, flip on over a couple of pages, uh, table I1 that shows some of those fastener bending yield strengths. And, and uh, Lori probably talked about those some with respect to technical report 12 as well. Um, but uh, for smaller diameter fasteners, they are based on some empirical tests that were done. Um, it's sometimes difficult to find those products labeled in a big box store you know, off the shelf. So your fallback there is to look for a proprietary manufacturer um, that has an evaluation report and most of the time they've done that testing to determine those bending yield strengths for their fasteners. 